I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer, I'm an inventor, and I'm an entrepreneur. I'm going to go right back to the dawn of the liquid crystal display, right to the beginning, which was the 28th of May, 1968. It's a very precise date. On that day, I want you to imagine that you are a cinema goer. You are going to see a film that came out just uh, four weeks ago. It had its premiere in New York. And you're in New York. You're in the Lowe's Capital uh, Movie Theatre. Uh, and you're watching uh, this film. So I hope you recognise that film. It is 2001, A Space Odyssey. It's uh, the masterpiece of Stanley Kubrick, uh, who directed it, and the writer with Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, there was a lot of invention in that movie, if you've seen it. Uh, you will have noticed uh, that uh, 30 or 40 years ahead of its time, uh, the astronauts were using Skype, they uh, uh, walked on the moon, uh, and they visited the International Space Station. Lots of uh, amazing uh, new technologies that the audience will have been fascinated by. But this clip is one of two clips that hint to something, a new device that had just been invented, the LCD. So basically, uh, uh, how did they know that by the year 2001, we would all be watching LCDs? Well, um, as you left this th cinema uh, in uh, Broadway here, and you walked down uh, uh, 0.3 miles, 10 minutes or so, to the Rockefeller building here, uh, you will have had a clue as to how that future would evolve. And that's because this building, the Rockefeller building, was uh, the headquarters of the RCA Corporation of America. And on that day at 5 uh, p.m. in the afternoon, uh, an inventor, uh, George Heilmeyer, had just demonstrated to the public the world's first LCD. It doesn't work like current LCDs, it was basically took two pieces of glass and put in a liquid crystal between them and it looked like milk and when you put an electric field across it, it didn't look like milk or vice versa. Uh, it looked very poor, but it was uh, of sufficient interest to the rest of the world to create a lot of uh, enthusiasm for this new wonderful invention. So much enthusiasm, of course, that the parent company, RCA, closed down their research efforts uh, two or three years later, and it was left to others to make the big inventions that led to the LCD. Mulvan, where we're here now, is a key player in that. Here you see Bison, the uh, uh, radio telescope that uh, was at RSRE at the time, or RRE as it was called, and their chief scientist is a man called Cyril Hilsom, who had heard about this, this fantastic new invention, and also knew that uh, for military, for helicopters, for, for planes, light, weight, flat panel displays were essential. So he put it together a team of people, Peter Raines working on uh, the actual physics of the liquid crystal materials and uh, uh, basic devices. Uh, George Gray at Hull University working on liquid crystal materials, new materials. Ben Sturgeon at Pool, a, a company called BDH, chemical company that could commercialise those liquid crystal materials. And Walter Spears and Peter Lacumba, who at the University of Dundee, were working on putting minute silicon circuitry, but on glass rather than on a silicon chip which was uh, what would be required to drive those displays. So it all came down really to the man, Cyril Hilsom, who started this. But he knew, and RCA knew about this technology, because 80 years earlier, an Austrian botanist called Friedrich Reinitzer had been studying carrots. Now carrots, as you'll see, uh, look like that. Hopefully you recognise them. <laughs> but if you look at... A, extract certain chemicals from them, uh, they have very strange properties, which he was the first to note. He was heating some materials up and they would uh, uh, go through two phase transitions, which was very unusual. I'm glad to say he didn't understand it at all, so it took uh, another physicist, 
uh, Otto Lehmann to explain what was happening. <coughs> so I'm going to try and explain it to you. So you have to go back to school. How can something be a liquid and a crystal? Well, you probably, from your school days, remember that all materials are made of molecules or atoms, or mo uh, groups of atoms called molecules. And when you draw them in your school book, you always would have heard, say, water is H2O, so two hydrogens and an oxygen, but you pretty much always draw it as a sphere. So when you uh, have a low temperature, you would have molecules wobbling around uh, in a fixed lattice, and when you heated them up, uh, you, your molecules would move around more so that they could break free of that lattice and form a liquid, and then if you heated up even more, you would eventually get the molecules to move far apart from each other and rapidly uh, uh, move in all different directions and form a gas. So where is the room for something in between this? How could something be a liquid and a crystal sit somewhere between here and here? The answer comes in the strange shape of the materials that Reinitz have found in this uh, material he extracted from carrot. So if you take uh, an organic molecule, most uh, uh, carrots are made of all organic materials, as am I, as are you. Uh, if you take them, some of them have a, 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 what's called an anisotropic shape. It is rod-like. So if I simplify this down and say I have a bunch of rods, then of course my crystal solid now not only has all the molecules packed on a lattice, but also all the molecules must point in the same direction which gives me an extra degree of order. So if I heat this up, I could lose some of the positional order of my molecules. They're now freely flowing, albeit in a layer, but they're all pointing in the same direction. And that's called a smectic liquid crystal. If I heat still further, my molecules start to uh, uh, all point in the same direction, but have no positional order. So if you imagine a bottle of this stuff, it looks like a normal liquid, you can pour it, but it scatters light associated with all these molecules uh, uh, moving but pointing in generally the right direction. And lastly, we can have an isotropic liquid just as before where we've lost that orientation order. So why is this of interest in displays? Well, it means that although we can put two glass plates together and insert this liquid between them, we can now influence the liquid by controlling its surfaces and putting electric fields across it. So if I take my long thin molecules here and I point an electric field, it should reorientate in the field as you see here. So I can start with one optical state and I can switch in a different optical state. How I see that is I will use polarized light. So just as you might wear polarized sunglasses because sunlight is polarized, I will put a polarizer on the front and the back of my display and then <coughs> when I point in one direction, I will let the light through and if I reorientate it with the electric field, then the light uh, is stopped. Now, of course, we now have TVs of this kind of complexity. This was an 8K 85 inch uh, uh, quantum dot based uh, LCD uh, that was released from Sa uh, by Samsung a couple of years ago. This has 33 million pixels. Each pic picture element, each with a liquid crystal rotating with electric fields. It's got 33 million transistors on the glass over this whole 85 inches. It has a very, very thin backlight behind the whole panel, polarizers, other films. It has quantum dots there, which will select very precise colors and make the color look extremely rich. It's a far throw away from what David Sarnoff, who'd started this work at RCA back in the 1960s, what he had predicted would be uh, for hang on the wall TV. Uh, it is clearly a, a, a magnificent piece of technology. Most of you are more familiar with LCDs from a technology it helped create. You will probably uh, view as much of uh, uh, your information not from a hang on the wall TV but from a mobile phone, a smartphone, something that was never envisaged because it was enabled by 
the LCD. So here you see the evolution of the LCD user. We'll skip through Einstein <laughs> to modern man and now to the modern student. And I'm now at a university, so I walk through city centres and I'm constantly uh, uh, really frustrated by people who just walk into me. And I often think that as an evolutionary step, the invention of the LCD and its, its most avid users is actually a regressionary step. Something where I'd hark back to the days of Einstein or maybe uh, the uh, late 1990s when I was quite happy to have to look at a map the night before and work out very carefully how I would get there, uh, how I would uh, be in, in town with some friends I couldn't find uh, and uh, at, at the last minute say, let's go to a restaurant and walk across the whole town where we're looking for somewhere to book. Uh, how most of my friends had disappeared uh, from my whole environment because my social network had shrunk down to the two or three people that I remembered to ring on their birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps it's not a regressionary step. So why did I get involved in liquid crystals? Well, I was at university and I did a project on them and I started to look at things like this under the microscope. Uh, when you heat a liquid crystal material, it may go through a whole rich variety of different phase transitions. And when you study them under the microscope, you can see a rich pageant of colour and the most beautiful textures. Uh, uh, there are a lot of artists working in the field that take inspiration uh, from liquid crystals and liquid crystal textures. So I became hooked. I found that fascinating that uh, you could have so much beauty in such simple materials. <coughs> so I got a job. I was recruited by uh, our man, Cyril Hilson, who's working here in Malvern at the Royal Signals and Radar Establishment. And over a, a few years, I worked on things as widespreadly uh, used as HDTV. We've seen that already. I also worked on holographic displays, uh, uh, where we were trying to make 3D displays that you could walk around, at least in an arc around them, and see the full 3D image. I then had a number of inventions, and one of them, I decided to spin a company out, which is called Display Data, which is again here in Malvern, and it makes uh, uh, bi-stable displays for shelf edge labels. So these are displays where you put the image on, use a bit of battery, and then uh, the image is retained even once you disconnect all the power. And then, in recent years, I've started my next company. I've started working on switchable contact lenses. Uh, uh, with a company I've uh, founded called Dynamic Vision Systems. So, if we look at that in more detail, how can <laughs> carrots help you see more clearly? <laughs> so, um, most of us uh, will get to the age of 50, 55 maybe, and almost everybody will suffer from a condition called presbyopia. So, the lens in your <coughs> eye will start to get a little more uh, hardened, and a little harder for the muscles in your eye to contract enough uh, so that you get complete vision. So you'll notice this at first, uh, you'll start to need reading glasses in your late 40s, where you get uh, about, uh, uh, require an extra two diopters or so, uh, so that you can read, uh, and so you, you're using your reading glasses, but as your lens gets worse and worse, you'll also start to struggle to see the far vision as well. So the eye will need some extra correction. Now, I get around that at the moment using bifocal lenses uh, where I can look up and I will see far vision, I look down and I can read. Uh, but uh, using liquid crystals, I hope that we could have an automatic contact lens where I can satisfy my vanity, remove the spectacles and be able to wear contact lenses but still be able to see. Not that I'd probably want to see me. Uh, at this age and stage. So the idea, this is a, a lab demonstrator, so I've yet to put this in my eye, as you can well imagine. <laughs> and, and, uh, I've not even uh, been so mean to my students as to expect them to try to wear it. But we've put electronics around the outside, and on the inside we have our liquid crystal element. And what that's doing is we apply a small voltage, three volts or so, and it switches 
uh, and changes its refractive index. And so changes from being a long vision lens, the type given by the plastic that's used for the contact lens, and then it corrects by adding an extra <coughs> two diopters when you put the voltage on and you want to, to read. And so here is it working. Hopefully you can see that, that it switches between these different states. All you need, your eye still needs about 20 diopters to see the far distance and near distance, but all you require is an extra two diopters to just help the eye. So this, the eye is still doing all the focusing, but you just need this little help. So this, once uh, it's all working, works from a mobile phone. The mobile phone will communicate with the contact lens and uh, switch it when you want to uh, read. Next topic I'm working on is on augmented vision. And so you've probably seen these. There's a, a, a spectacles uh, where you wear uh, uh, normal looking spectacles, but in the side of the spectacle is a small liquid crystal display, and then some projection optics that project an image that is uh, in the distance, but uh, put onto the inside lens of your spectacles. And so this enables you to have augmented information. So the example shown here is you have your flight information just appearing in the spectacle like that. So uh, the reason this interests me is I've, again, I've made another invention recently that enables me to control the light uh, irrespective of the polarization using the liquid crystals. So I can get all of the light uh, to come through the lenses and not have to have dark lenses that enable you to do this. So again, after many years of working in the area, I am still happily inventing. <coughs> and so I believe that this situation is not one that I would aspire to. I would say that uh, uh, being an engineer, uh, inventing, taking those inventions to towards products is not uh, 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 creating this regressive step, but indeed is part of the purpose of what we should all do. As an inventor, as a scientist, I have always wanted to improve society. I think everything I've done is very small compared to many people's uh, uh, improvements, but I think it is a really key factor in being a scientist to push forward society, no matter how small a movement it is, uh, so that we can uh, get to our eventual goal. Lots of people ask me um, if I have all of these aspirations and want to invent things and uh, uh, spin out companies and, and get new products on the supermarket shelves, then why do I end up uh, uh, teaching in a university? Well, I can only answer that one way, which is with another film reference, and I'll let you decide what that reference means. Thank you very much. <laughs>